through its fifth year, the United Nations drive hard against Nazi Germany and carry the attack at last even to the fatherland itself. Today, the energy of every German is consumed in total war. For now they know that their only defense against death from machines made by their enemy in America is to surpass American production. These plain-looking civilians have always been one of Hitler's most potent secret weapons. They help make this war possible, and they are the enemy we must ultimately defeat to finish it. In our duel against the worker behind the Nazi guns, the great force resisting us is his fierce devotion to his assigned task. Today, even at home, during his few hours off duty, the German worker is in the grip of the dictatorship that controls his life. A fury of propaganda exhorts the people to save themselves and the Nazi regime from the hell into which Nazi schemes have plunged them. They are hypnotized with official lies, but the trumpets of attack which shake Germany's very walls stir more sober workers to reflect uneasily on the fate of the Germany that used to be. The land the Nazis took over a dozen years ago was civilized and thriving. It was a leading industrial power of Europe. In Nazi hands, German industry was to be transformed into a fearful power for evil. But before Hitler, workers in plants like the great Krupp works were making steel for peace, for bridges, for modern homes, for automobiles, and for railroads. Germans had inherited a tradition of craftsmanship, and none could fabricate better the precision apparatus and delicate tools of science. German research dominated a worldwide network of patents and monopolies. And Germany's position at the crossroads of the continent was making her the commercial center of Europe. In the early 30s, the capital, Berlin, expressed the vigor of a democratic Germany, recovering slowly but steadily from the First World War. People lived a neat and ordered life for which Germans had always been renowned. Some enjoyed great riches. And though there was serious poverty, especially as the Depression came on, the needs of the frugal poor were somehow satisfied. To casual tourists, German nights seemed filled with music and good beer. But in the back streets during the early 30s, plain citizens were still haunted by the aftermath of 1918. Almost everyone had a plan for better days. The general restlessness often flared up. But the indulgent republic was content to let things ride. Increasingly appeared the brown shirts of a movement masquerading as a political party, which in the name of discipline promoted fascism. To all comers, the aspiring leader proclaimed that the last war had been lost by treachery at home, that to win the coming war, the German worker must be as strong as a soldier. Those who disagreed must be made to conform, 
most did not agree. But the Nazis bulled their way through, and in 1934, Adolf Hitler named himself absolute leader of the German Reich. Immediately, German industry began to shift from peace to war. One by one, in secret, factories were retooled. Workers whose unions had been destroyed found themselves drafted into making weapons for the army of Hitler's Germany. In 1936, their hard work bore first fruit when the reconditioned army moved into the Rhineland. No opposition came from a world too anxious for peace. Then, Hitler brazenly occupied his weak neighbors one by one. In triumph, he rode into Vienna. Back home, before the workers who had built it, and before alarmed observers from the outside world, the Führer paraded his war machine. Startling indeed was the strength of the Air Force, which had strained the German worker so that the Nazis could blackmail Europe. Using the threat of war as a trump card, the Axis partners ganged up on the democracies and dismembered Czechoslovakia. After Munich, many circuses spread before the German worker the glory of his handiwork. By following his leader, by training for work just as a soldier trains for battle, the worker had become in six years the most important little man in Europe. Those who had wavered could no longer dispute the Führer's policies, for he had almost doubled the size of the Reich. And then, Nazi arrogance goose-stepped into war. None was more amazed than the German worker when his panzer divisions erased Poland in 18 days. And none was more proud than he when shifting to the west, the Blitzkrieg cut through the Low Countries and over France with the precision of a well-practiced maneuver. Paratroopers along the roads they had just captured greeted German soldiers racing to Dunkirk and the Channel Coast. With a gay tune, we sail against England. Berlin rang with the same song, for only a tiny island stood between the Hitler-crazed people and their most extravagant dreams. At last, the Luftwaffe was to have its day. But the small RAF stubbornly held its fragment of sky and proved that an assault on Britain would be more than a sideshow. To get minerals, food and oil for his conquest of England, Hitler turned east. His war machine hammered at the heart of Russia. So imminent seemed victory that Japan rushed into the Axis game and at Pearl Harbor brought the United States into the war. German workers launched better than a submarine a day in a race to keep American products from taking effect on the battle line. When a skipper spotted a convoy, he radioed its position to headquarters in Germany. Other submarines were ordered into the attack area to form a wolf pack. The packs operated by secret tactics shown in this diagram. They took so heavy a toll that Allied shipping lanes were almost severed. Every German boy dreamt of becoming a submarine hero. But Nazi submarines ran afoul of the American Navy and the nation of workers behind it. And gradually these two, together with the other United Nations, 
forced the Nazis to give way. Defeat in the Atlantic opened the sea lanes to convoys and brought the German worker to grips at last with his ultimate opponent, American industrial capacity and the American worker. The flood of steel across the Atlantic hardened the many battlefronts on which the Wehrmacht is now at bay. They must hold back advancing Russian army. In Italy, they must fight desperate delaying actions to stave off further retreat to the homeland. Under Himmler, many special divisions must be trained as hangmen for the rebellious people of the continent. The Luftwaffe is locked in deadly combat with air forces flying from England to lay waste the plants and factories of Germany. And while heavily engaged on all fronts, they must gird themselves to meet allied amphibious invasions. Today, as the Reich faces the war's sixth year, no longer can its people enjoy the illusion of world mastery. But the Nazis are nonetheless confident because Germany is still one of the greatest industrial powers the world has ever seen. In answer to military setbacks, war industry speeds production. In factories near Leipzig, on assembly lines like those in America, German workers double the armor on Tiger tanks for the Eastern Front. Even now, new diesel engines are being developed for super bombers like the Junkers 86P with its nine-mile ceiling. But such large-scale production is using up Germany's manpower reserves, already drained away by the Reichswehr's greed for cannon fodder. With Nazi pomp, they memorialize their hero dead, who by the million have given their lives for Germany and bound all Germans in a blood brotherhood of revenge. The bereaved woman is taken from child breeding in the home to dedicate herself to the fatherland in other forms of production. And Nazi children are made to do their bit until at 16 they are old enough for the armies. Today, German leaders count upon the factories, raw materials and manpower of the conquered countries to offset any pinch in their own productive capacity. More than half the German labor force are captives who must work or starve. Czechs in the great Skoda works, imported Baltic miners in the mines of the Saar Basin, all sweat for Nazi Germany. Shiploads of skilled workers are delivered by Norway's Quisling and other Nazi puppets to release young Germans for the armies. From Poland and from betrayed Italy and Hungary have been driven thousands of slaves for the roads of the Reich. French prisoners broken by four years of captivity are thrown back to their families in exchange for able-bodied countrymen condemned to servitude in their stead. To Germany's own stockpiles has been added the booty of a continent. The equipment of entire armies, such as the once proud army of France, thought sufficient in itself to hold the Nazis in check. These salvaged war machines are now at work against the United Nations. With such strength at hand, the Germans do not for a moment think of themselves as beaten. Yet Germany today is not the Germany that set out to conquer the world. They have been compelled to shift their plans. Around themselves, they have built the fortress Europe, and within the security of its walls, they prepare to make their boldest stand. The ramparts are studded with huge guns, among them not a few from the fabulous Maginot line. And deep into the interior, engineers have built supporting chains of fortifications. Transported from the bombed areas, vital industries have been so redesigned in groups called complexes that severe bombing may diminish but will not halt production. The German worker now concentrates on weapons of defense, 
such as the new Focke Wolfe fighter. And also to protect Germany, he builds searchlights and anti-aircraft guns like the Flak 36, which throws a curtain of shells seven miles high. At the Rheinmetall Borsi, 16-inch, 50-foot rifles for the Fortress Europe are being assembled. Submarines are still being completed at Stettin on the Baltic to lie in wait for the invading armies outside Fortress Europe. Once again, the Nazis play upon German industry as an instrument to fit their plans, and German industry responds. The life of every German worker is regimented by a master plan more strict than ever. No matter who else in Europe starves, he will eat. But what he eats is measured by what he produces. This plan follows him home where there is a use even for the garbage from his one-dish meal. His clothes, though still neat, are wearing thin and keeping presentable is a problem for every German. For his moment of strutting, the little man pays dearly as the war comes home, yet he shows no signs of panic. But lest his faith waver, the Gestapo exhibits the dire things that may befall him. Young as well as old can find outlet for war nerves by tormenting the people the Nazis have banished. They are inspired by their top ace, Hauptmann Novotny, who thanks them for the equipment with which his fighter group is said to have brought down over 300 British and American planes. And it's a red letter day when Hermann Goering himself drops in on a busy war plant. But often, very often now, the air raid alert reminds the workers that there is a weakness in their Nazi paradise. Bombs leak through the roof. They take to the shelters. Every day, a German factory town is pounded to rubble. But 12 Spartan years have purposefully hardened them to withstand such ordeals without a crack up this time on the home front. The bodies of American boys who will not fly again gratify them less than the mounting graveyards of fortresses and Wellingtons. Their deliberate plan regards no sacrifice as a loss if in return it exacts a high enough price from the enemy. The same plan governs every phase of their fight today. Even in retreat, they are not a beaten foe. They blast roads and bridges in an orgy of destruction. They lay minefields in the path of their pursuers. They drive every living thing before them into their fortress leaving a blasted wasteland that Allied armies can cross only slowly, paying a fearful toll for every yard. Germany plans to fight the invaders field by field and house by house across the entire continent of Europe. German chieftains know well their present military position makes the time ripe for Allied invasions. They know we have the Jap to deal with before he consolidates his conquests. And we will not delay. Even if we do dent the fortress wall, they will make their counterattack the real test. The spider web of roads and railways linking their frontiers will bring to bear against us the reserves they have been husbanding and in quantities greater by far, they think, than we can bring up with all our fleets. Today, in the heart of Fortress Europe, the masters stage great meetings to honor those Germans who have worked hardest and best. The crisis Germany faces, the people are told, demands that every German break production records as these workers have done. 
the same hoarse voice which has been the voice of Germany for a dozen years, still excites their fervor. Their twisted minds believe his promise of secret weapons. They jeer at the rotten democracy. As he accepts his biggest assignment, a struggle to death with his enemy in America, each Nazi worker hurls across the seas the defiance of all Nazis. Meine deutschen Volksgenossen, unser Kampf ist grimm. Unsere Arbeit heißt Leben oder Tod für uns. Die Amerikaner sehen den Krieg nur aus den Zeitungen. Aber wir Deutschen sind im Kriegsgeschäft alte Kämpfer. Unsere Arbeit wird es diesen Amerikanern schon zeigen. Sie fangen jetzt schon an, ihre verweichlichte Lebensart zu vermissen. Sie werden schon müde werden. Amerika wird einen Kompromiss schließen. Sie werden uns um Frieden bitten, solange wir durchhalten. Und wir werden durchhalten. Heil Hitler! Sieg! 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 Sieg!